Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening, it's Wednesday, September 1st. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. And we begin with a search underway right now. The Navy looking for five crew members lost at sea after a helicopter from the USS Abraham Lincoln crashed in the waters off of San Diego. KPBS military reporter Steve Walsh with the latest details. The accident happened around 4.30 Tuesday afternoon. A MH-60S helicopter was operating on the deck of the carrier when it crashed roughly 60 miles off the coast of San Diego. One sailor was recovered. The Navy and Coast Guard spent Wednesday searching for five other crew members. Another five sailors were injured on board the USS Lincoln. Two of them were flown ashore for treatment and are listed in stable condition. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin acknowledged the accident. I know the Navy is working diligently at search and rescue operations. And on behalf of the whole department, I want to pass on our thoughts and prayers for the best possible outcome. Since 2018, the Navy has had at least four crashes involving versions of the MH-60. The helicopter fitted for sea duty is called the Seahawk. In July, one fitted for air rescue crashed near Mount Hogue, California in the Sierra Nevada mountains. The crew was not injured, but they could not be rescued until the following day. In 2020, a Seahawk from the USS Blue Ridge crashed in the Philippine Sea. Five sailors had to be rescued. In 2018, 12 sailors were injured when a Seahawk assigned to the carrier USS Ronald Reagan crashed just after takeoff. Before the accident Tuesday, the San Diego-based USS Lincoln was conducting air trials off the coast. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. The U.S. Secretary of Defense today called on Americans to thank all military service members who served in Afghanistan and honor those who died in the nearly 20-year war. We remember 2,461 American service members and personnel who paid the ultimate price in this war. And more than 20,000 wounded Americans some still carrying the scars that you can't see on the outside. Secretary Austin also gave the final total of evacuation, 6,000 Americans and more than 124,000 Afghan civilians. The effort to evacuate anyone left behind has transitioned from a military mission to a diplomatic mission handled by the Department of State. A father from El Cajon is sharing his family's harrowing experience of fighting their way back home after visiting family in Afghanistan. Assad, who only wanted to be identified by his first name, spoke with our media partner, KGTV. The father of three Cajon Valley School District students said he did everything he could to keep the children calm as gunshots rang out on the way to the Kabul airport. My little daughter... Uh... She was like six, so just like it's a tradition in Afghanistan when there is a wedding, so they like they shoot uh, in the air. So I was just telling my little daughter that don't worry, it's a wedding, so nothing is going to happen. After two days, the family finally made it into the airport and began their journey home. One other family from the Cajon Valley School District is still in Afghanistan. The San Diego County Board of Supervisors passed what's believed to be a first in the nation resolution declaring misinformation surrounding the pandemic a public health crisis. As KPBS health reporter Matt Hoffman shows us, it came after hours of public comment. The resolution says misinformation surrounding coronavirus is prolonging the pandemic and potentially deadly for San Diegans. During a marathon board meeting Tuesday night, the region's largest health care providers spoke in favor of it. Misinformation is a poison to our communities and it is having a ripple effect in our hospitals. We have a pandemic of the unvaccinated. This is about taking a more active role in developing resources to combat misinformation 
in order to help our community make informed health choices. There were just over 170 public speakers on the resolution, majority against it, claiming it infringes on their First Amendment rights. If this passes tonight, the sun will come up in the morning and everyone who's here will still have the exact same ability to speak out and to say whatever it is you would like to say. But if this passes tonight, our county will be on record calling out misinformation for what it is. The resolution directs county staff to be more aggressive in combating misinformation, some of which was heard during the board meeting. And I think the first thing that you can do is get rid of this notion that that Pfizer vaccine has been approved by the FDA. It has not, and I can give you the letter if you like it. Everybody with a clue knows that these COVID tests are absolutely irrelevant. Well, it's a biotoxin. It's a bioweapon. An experimental gene therapy bio I mean, it's like you could call it so many things. It's not even a vaccine. Some question who gets to decide what misinformation is and claim that the pandemic is being made up or exaggerated. It's all and been a big plot. This is a huge scam. You're creating a crisis that isn't there. Why do you care who dies? Wouldn't that be kind of a blessing? There's too many people on the planet, right? Let people die. Let, let that, that, that process take place. Others were there to voice their concerns about vaccine mandates. We don't want it at all. We just want to have that choice to opt out. The board was split. None of us want to see our neighbors die or our family or our friends, but um, I don't know how you stop misinformation or free speech, and nor would I want to. Supervisors ultimately voted three to two to adopt the resolution. I believe that the masks work. I believe that the vaccine works. I believe that we have. And so I am not going to back down from doing what I believe is right. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. For the latest on the pandemic and resources, check out the tracking COVID-19 section at kpbs.org. And that includes details on vaccines, the latest case numbers, and our local reporting. You can get there by clicking the link on our homepage. More than 50,000 people are running away from flames that have already burned over 200,000 acres. The Caldor Fire has destroyed 544 homes and nearly 35,000 structures near Lake Tahoe. It is just 20 percent contained tonight and poor weather conditions make it likely it will continue spreading. Dan Simon has details. Fire crews racing to contain the Calder fire as the blaze is now turning and threatening parts of Nevada. We are using all of our resources, everything we have at our disposal. Firefighters battled throughout the night to protect homes and businesses in the vacation enclave South Lake Tahoe. Tuesday, the streets in the area filled with dense smoke, leaving the area completely deserted. Crews were standing by to protect homes as the flames started coming down the mountainside. Residents preparing for the worst, fearful they will lose everything. What's going through your mind? Uh, everything we're leaving, you know, our hotel, our, our whole town, our jobs, everything. Just stay invited to our town, possibly. Dry conditions and heavy winds have fueled the Caldor fire for several days. So far, it's burned nearly 200,000 acres. California is taking every measure to try to contain the Caldor fire with planes dropping retardant chemicals and hundreds of fire trucks and water trucks in the area ready to help. The state has also deployed thousands of firefighters and National Guard troops to battle the blaze. All residents and tourists in El Dorado County and the surrounding areas have been ordered to evacuate. When we were going through our house, you're kind of going through the boxes and you're like, okay, what can I leave behind and what do I have to take? You know, and we've got six kids and so it's it was very hard to say, okay, do I keep their preschool pictures? The more than 53,000 residents scrambled to pack and get out as quickly as possible, causing traffic jams that left roadways backed up for miles. I've never seen anything like this before. I've never seen Tahoe be deserted and empty before. Some evacuees forced to set up camp at this shelter in Carson City, Nevada. I got the clothes on my back right now, and I got the important papers. That's it. I'm worried to death.
And crews are making progress on the Chaparral fire burning in San Diego and Riverside counties. It is now 80 percent contained, up from 50 percent yesterday. The more than 1,400 acre fire erupted last weekend at the edge of the Cleveland National Forest. Two structures burned and a firefighter sustained minor injuries. All California National Forests are closed until September 17th because of wildfire conditions. A new rental assistance program for landlords is now available through the county with a tenant program set to start on Friday. But as KPBS North County reporter Tanya Thorne found out, some are hesitant to apply. The pandemic caused many San Diego renters to fall late on their rent. And although rental assistance programs have become available, Herminia Ramirez says people aren't rushing to apply. There's a lot of questions and unknowns for, for community members that it's hard for them to trust in this type of assistance, and particularly with the, the population that we serve and we focus on in, in my program. Ramirez manages programs for outreach and migrant health for Vista Community Clinic. Starting today, community organizations like Vista Community Clinic will begin outreach for the county's newest rental assistance program. This one is aimed at helping landlords operating less than five rental units. Qualifying landlords may receive up to $15,000 per unit in late rent dating back to April 2020. Maria Yanis is the housing program manager for the city of Oceanside. She says the application process for this program is also online, something not everyone is comfortable with. In a tech-savvy world, you would think everybody would be up to par on all the tech technology and how we can get um, documents done. We've had a lot of individuals have um, limited capacity on what they can and can't do online. Um, many of them themselves don't know how to um, maneuver through an online portal, let alone upload documents. Yanis says many times people needing assistance prefer a face-to-face -face meeting versus online or over the phone. Ramirez says the county is relying on community-based organizations to help with that. I think the county learned a lot from the trusted messenger model that's been issued out in for other efforts. And, um, and so I think there's a lot to be said for that type of approach and really putting the resources in the community. Information on rental assistance programs can be found on the county website or by calling 211 to connect to a local agency for assistance. Tanya Thorne, KPBS News. Still climbing, the price of a home in San Diego has gone up more than 27 percent in a year, and that is the second largest price jump in the country. That is according to Case Logic Case Schiller report. San Diego prices have also exceeded other California home markets, but the metro area still has not reached its record, which was 33.4 percent increase over 12 months recorded in July of 2004. Analysts say the low inventory of the available homes, coupled with low mortgage rates and better financial status of remote workers, are all factors that keep the market high. The only market with price gains higher than San Diego? Well, that would be Phoenix, Arizona, at just over 29 percent. We have an update about a South Bay brewery that was recently forced to take down its outdoor dining area while its neighbors were able to keep theirs. KPBS reporter Melissa May has been following the story. Just a few weeks ago, the owner of Chula Vista Brewery was ordered to take down his parklet, an outdoor dining space, and questioned why his neighbors could keep theirs. Today, the city of Chula Vista has granted Timothy Parker and the Chula Vista Brewery a new parklet space. And today we have a lot to be proud of in that regard. Shane Harris is the president of the People's Association of Justice Advocates and helped file the original claim against the city of Chula Vista. Today was considered a win for everyone involved. What we plan on doing and moving forward is just going to be an awesome addition to the brewery. And I have to thank everybody involved for helping me do this. Timothy Parker is the owner of Chula Vista Brewery and is grateful that the city is giving him a permit for an outdoor space to complement his new food truck. The National Black Contractors Association already has plans to relocate these plants and create a handicap accessible deck that will add up to 30 additional seats and be an extension of the brewery. This will restore opportunities for this business to sustain its economic sustainability. And one of the things that we are so proud to do is that we're developing or working with the architects and the owners to, divide, to design something that's aesthetically enhancing to this community. Abdur Rahim Hamid is the president of the National Black Contractors Association and says building this outdoor space turns what could have been a tragedy of injustice into a showpiece of justice. 
The brewery is also getting $15,000 in COVID relief funds from a city program to help local businesses build parklets. Melissa May, KPBS News. The fall semester kicked off today at the University of San Diego. An estimated 31,000 students are enrolled, and along with academics and athletics, students will still be dealing with the pandemic. Officials say 88% of students and 91% of all employees are vaccinated. Those granted exemptions must be regularly tested. Masks are required on campus. A law effectively banning abortions at six weeks is now in effect in Texas after the U.S. Supreme Court did not act on calls from abortion rights activists to block it. As Karen Kaifa reports, the inaction is raising questions about the future of Roe v. Wade. With the U.S. Supreme Court not stepping in to stop it, one of the nation's most restrictive abortion laws took effect in Texas at midnight Wednesday. Absent further intervention by the court, the law bans Texas abortions after about six weeks, once a fetal heartbeat can be detected and before many women even know they're pregnant. Our creator endowed us with the right to life. Republican Governor Greg Abbott signed the law in May. There are no exceptions for rape or incest, only some considerations for medical emergencies. It allows private citizens to file civil suits against anyone who assists a person who receives abortion services in violation of the ban. That can include providers, but also someone who simply drives a patient to an abortion clinic. Successful plaintiffs are entitled to a minimum $10,000 in damages. Planned Parenthood is among abortion providers engaged in the court battle against the law. Empowering any citizen in any state to bring essentially a bounty onto anyone who is supporting someone trying to get an abortion in Texas is really what is just so draconian. In a statement, President Biden called the law extreme and a blatant violation of Roe versus Wade. The landmark 1973 Supreme Court decision that legalized abortion nationwide will face a challenge next term. The conservative majority court will hear arguments around a Mississippi law that bans abortions after 15 weeks. In Washington, Karen Kafa, KPBS News. From widespread power outages to dangerous heat, Ida's impact is being felt throughout southern Louisiana and Mississippi. And as Daryl Forges reports, the system is now moving north, where life-threatening flash flooding is forecast. It's, it's horrible here right now, horrible. No electricity, scorching heat, food, water and gas, and short supply. These people are going to wait hours to get gas, probably seven, eight hours to get gas. It, it's, it's not good. Many of those left in Louisiana lining up for gas. Some who chose to ride out the storm now packing the highways to get out. Others trying to keep their generators going. We're hoping that we can get gas in time before the food goes bad. Crews struggling to restore power, but there's no end in sight. Officials say power could be out for weeks in Louisiana. There's, there's thousands of men and women out there in this heat working hard to get it back on. Nobody's happy with the progress thus far. In places where Ida wreaked the most havoc, cleanup is underway amid damage to homes, roads, bridges, and businesses. This is devastating. It's um, nothing left to the shopping center. Mississippi's governor urging the state to remain on high alert, watching out for unsafe roads and bridges. When you get 12 inches over a very short period of time, uh, just with flooding and, and other uh, avenues, uh, it gets it's really, really challenging. And Ida's not done yet. Other states now feeling the impact, bracing for potentially life-threatening flash flooding. In New Orleans, Daryl Forges, KPBS News. A tropical moisture we've had as a result of NOR is slowly going to exit here over the next couple of days, bringing sunshine and drier conditions back into the forecast and also some warmer temperatures. We're going to see a little bit of a rise, not significant, but by a couple degrees, which should for the most part warm up over the next several days. Heading into tonight, temperatures fall back down to the low to mid 60s from Escondido out towards Oceanside, upper 50s in Ramona, Brago Springs falling off into the low 70s. A little bit of cloud cover, marine layer thickens up tonight and into the morning hours but we should see things clear up as we move into the afternoon. We're getting back up into the mid 70s in San Diego. El Cajon getting up into the low 80s. Triple digits for you over in Borrego Springs. And the pattern again looks to stay pretty tranquil here as we move into Thursday and Friday too. You'll notice continued dry conditions here across much of Nevada, California, Southern California. All the wet weather looks to stay kind of confined here to the Four Corners region. Even that should be lessening a little bit here as we move through the 
these next several days. So drier, calmer, warmer pattern setting up here. As we look at your forecast near the coast, temperatures go from the mid 70s up into the low 80s here for your Saturday, Sunday, wraps back down into the upper 70s there as we head into Monday. Further inland temperatures see a little bit of a more dramatic warm up here. We go from the low 80s with some low clouds and fog there on Thursday to the upper 80s by Saturday. 90s in the forecast there for Sunday with plenty of sunshine in the forecast in the mountains. We go from the low 70s here into the low to mid 70s by the time we get into next week. Not a whole lot of change. We'll see a little bit more cloud cover here for the second half of the weekend, but no real uh, significant moisture in the forecast and we'll likely see more in the way of sunshine than cloud cover over the next five days. And in the desert, temperatures go from just hanging on to that triple digit heat from 100 up to 105, 107 as we move into Saturday and Sunday. For KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Jessica Pash. San Diego Reps Latinx New Play Festival celebrates giving a voice to underrepresented communities. KPBS arts reporter Beth Acamando speaks with three of the playwrights to find out what inspired them and what stories they wanted to tell. Get ready for the Reps Latinx New Play Festival. Ladies and gentlemen, the show you are about to see is a construct of fact and fantasy. Artistic inspiration can come from many places or just one. <laughs> anger. Anger inspired me. That's what <laughs> inspired me. Playwright Rachel Lynette hit a boiling point after Jennifer Krug confessed to being a racial imposter. And that deeply upset me because she was a white woman specifically pretending to be Afro-Latina. And I'm Afro-Latina and I have had to fight and claw my way into just getting other people to recognize my identity and all this white woman had to do was tan her skin. That anger and frustration led to the play Black Mexican. The short version, it's about a lot of big things, but the easiest way to say it is a student starts to question whether or not the professor is actually Cuban or not. Meanwhile, there is a Belizean character who's trying to figure out if she counts as part of the Latin identity as well. It's kind of an exploration of what does it mean to be part of this identity that encompasses so many different countries that are all so different. And also, in what, who do we give access to our culture and who do we keep out and why? Lynette specifically sets her play in a city she describes as one that thinks it's liberal because that's another source of anger. So I kind of really wanted to say, like, don't try to put this in like a southern town where they don't know better. No, this is a liberal town where people claim to embrace diversity and yet this still keeps happening. But for Daniela de Jesus, it was Disney's Pocahontas and an epiphany she had that inspired her play, Get Your Pink Hands Off Me Sucka and Give Me Back. I remember there's this moment in um, like the sixth grade when I was learning about the colonization of the Caribbean and the Americas and learning how old Pocahontas probably actually was, that she was like between the ages of 11 and 14. And me realizing that, oh, I'm 11. And there's no way that me having a romantic relationship with a 30 year old man is okay. Like that's messed up. This led her to use her play to explore intergenerational trauma. The idea that trauma that happened to an ancestor three, four, five or more generations ago can manifest as an anxiety attack or a particular insecurity is really interesting to me. I like to think that because of that, in a way that history is is always happening, like it's not in the past, it like reverbs through what we're experiencing right now. The past was a major source of inspiration for Nicholas R. Valdez's play, Conjunto Blues. Pues orale. It's really kind of a, a nod, an, a, an ode, if you will, to my grandparents' generation. Coming out of this um, depression era experience, really, I think kind of created a pathway for a Mexican-American identity. Informing that identity was Conjunto music, which Valdez says was the origin of accordion-based Mexican-American music. The accordion and Conjunto music, I think, really is the soundtrack to the Mexican-American working class experience of the 20th century. When people listen to the accordion, I think it's very nostalgic. El acordeón es muy emocional. And it is a very expressive instrument in the way that it breathes. Listen to her breathe. Eh? 
I learned early on to appreciate the instrument and to appreciate what it represented for the culture of San Antonio and for, for the Mexican American community at large. The instrument becomes a character in the play, which explores how conjunto music developed as an expression of cultural resistance and liberation. Valdez carries on that tradition of activism in his play, which was inspired by the legacy of Luis Valdez's Teatro Campesino. And it's theater with the purpose, right? Like an urgency. And there is a magic that happens in, in, in that engagement in live theater. And it gives you an opportunity to address very serious issues, to ask really important and difficult questions, but in a way that is accessible and entertaining. And that can provoke a conversation and inspire other people to tell their own stories. You can enjoy these stories as part of San Diego Rep's Latinx New Play Festival this weekend. Beth Acomando, KPBS News. Now here's another look at today's top stories. The search continues for five missing sailors after a U.S. Navy helicopter crashed off the coast of San Diego. One sailor was rescued shortly after yesterday's crash and is in the hospital. Five other sailors who were aboard the USS Abraham Lincoln aircraft carrier where the chopper was based were injured. And the San Diego County Board of Supervisors has declared COVID-19 misinformation a public health crisis. Last night's three to two vote followed hours of passionate public comment with opponents expressing concern that the measure would discourage the free exchange of ideas. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thanks for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Good night. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, proud to support the mission of KPBS and privileged to serve San Diego clients. Anderson Plumbing, Heating and Air, helping homeowners maintain drain, heating and cooling systems since 1978. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you.